Welcome back to the Intro to Orgo series, part 3 of 5. In this video, I will cover the octet rule and bonding, including ionic bonds, covalent nonpolar bonds, and polar covalent bonds. Recall from the last video where we said an atom can have up to 8 electrons in its outermost shell, 2 in the s orbital, and 6 in the p orbital. As you recall, the s orbital does not have any suborbitals, which gives me a total of 2 paired electrons and the p orbital had the px, py, and pz, giving me a total of six electrons. Now electrons prefer to be paired, so when an atom has all eight electrons filled in the outermost shell, it is considered happy or stable. And this is the basis of the octet rule. The octet rule simply says that an atom prefers to have a full valence shell with eight electrons. Exceptions to this rule, of course, are hydrogen, and helium, which each only have an s orbital, which can have a maximum of two electrons. Recall once again that noble gases are unreactive, and now we can understand why. A noble gas has a full octet, it doesn't need any more electrons, so it has no reason to seek interaction or to react with any other atoms. And this introduces a concept that you will see over and over in organic chemistry. If an atom or a molecule is happy, it is unreactive. If an atom or a molecule is unhappy, that's when it's going to be reactive because that's when it's going to look for a way to find that happiness. This works out very well for a noble gas, but what about atoms that don't have a full octet? So we'll start from the right of the table and look at something like fluorine. Drawing the Lewis dot structure for fluorine, we know that we have a total of seven valence electrons. That means an atom like fluorine is seeking one more electron to fill that octet. To solve its problem, fluorine will find an atom that has an electron to give away, steal that electron, and now have eight. Fluorine now has a full octet, but what about its charge? So let's take a look again at the table, and we see that fluorine has a plus nine in its nucleus coming from its nine protons, minus ten for electrons because of the nine original and this one additional electron stolen. We now get a charge of negative one. So we now have a fluoride ion with a charge of minus one. An ion is something that either gained or lost an electron and now has either a positive or negative charge. The two types of ions are the cation, which is simply a positive ion. And one easy way to remember this is to replace the T in the word cation with a positive charge. The second ion is the anion. And this is a negative ion. And the way you can remember this is the prefix a or an typically means missing or without. Let's look at oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons, which means that oxygen needs two more electrons to fill its octet. Just like fluorine, oxygen will steal those two electrons from another atom. And now it has eight electrons. Oxygen has a plus eight from its eight protons, has negative ten from a total of 10 electrons, giving me negative two. So an oxygen with a full octet is an oxide ion with a charge of minus two. Now let's move to the left of the table and look at an atom like sodium. Sodium has a total of 11 electrons. That's two in its first shell, eight in its second shell, and only one electron in its third shell. For sodium to steal enough electrons to gain a full octet, it would have to steal seven electrons, which is impossible for an atom to do because stealing even one electron takes energy, two electron takes more, but seven is impossible. So instead of stealing electrons, sodium will simply give up its outermost electron. We now have an empty shell. If we look at the shell below, we now have a full octet made from the eight electrons in sodium's second shell. We now have positive 11 for the 11 protons, but we have negative 10 because we only have 10 electrons. This gives me a plus one charge for the sodium ion. Lithium has a total of three electrons, two in the innermost shell and one in its valence shell. Like sodium, lithium cannot gain seven electrons, but instead will lose that outer electron, losing the entire outer shell, and this reverts back to the initial shell which has a total of two electrons. We have a plus three in the nucleus, minus two for the electrons gives me a total of plus one. 
From the examples we've shown, you see that when an atom gains or loses electrons, the final shell is going to have a noble gas configuration because once again the noble gases are more stable and the octet rule says that every atom wants to be like a noble gas. We know that opposites attract and this happens with ions as well. A positive ion, for example Na+, will be attracted to a negative ion, for example Cl-, and give me NaCl, which is your common table salt. If we have something like Ca2+, and we combine this with a negative ion, for example F-, because calcium has a plus 2 charge, we will need two fluoride ions to balance it, giving me CaF2. An ionic bond can take place between both monoatomic and polyatomic ions. The word monoatomic comes from mono, atom, meaning an ion made out of just one atom. For example, sodium or oxide. The word polyatomic comes from polyatom, meaning two or more atoms that make up an ion. This would be a molecule that has a charge, for example, something like NH4 plus ammonium or CH3 CO2 minus the acetate ion. Examples of ionic bonds with polyatomic and monoatomic ions would be something like ammonium chloride, which is NH4Cl, or sodium acetate, which is Na and then CH3 CO2. For our next topic, Let's look at an atom like carbon, which has four valence electrons. In order for carbon to reach a full octet, it will either have to gain four electrons or lose four electrons. But gaining or losing more than one or two electrons will require too much energy on the atom and not likely to happen. Instead, carbon will opt to share electrons with another atom also looking to complete its octet without gaining or losing electrons. Methane, which is CH4, is composed of one carbon and four hydrogens. Each of these hydrogens need one more electron to complete their octet. So hydrogen and carbon will opt to share everywhere there is an open electron. This way, each atom gets to complete its octet without giving up an electron. A covalent bond can take place between two atoms of different type, like in the methane example, or between two atoms of the same type, such as this F2 molecule here and this H2 molecule here. These covalent bonds are often represented by simply drawing a line between the two atoms without showing electrons. When you see this line, look at it as if it's a dumbbell understanding that there is one electron on the end of each side. That when you have an atom with a high or strong electronegativity, like fluorine, as long as it's two fluorine atoms sharing, they have an equal bond between them. The same thing happens when you have a molecule made of two atoms of low electronegativity because once again their electronegativities are balanced. Polar covalent bonds on the other hand are formed between atoms that have a significant difference in electronegativity. Before looking at examples though, let's define polarity. When you think of the word polarity or pole, what probably comes to mind is the concept of a magnetic pole or the north and south pole meaning opposites. The same concept applies here for polar bonds because a polar bond is formed between an atom that has a high electronegativity and an atom that has a lower electronegativity. In general chemistry you learn how to calculate the actual polarity of a bond by subtracting the difference in electronegativities. In organic chemistry because it's all about understanding you should be able to eyeball the periodic table and guess if a molecule will have a polar or nonpolar covalent bond. If I look at a bond between hydrogen and beryllium, because they're very close on the table, their electronegativities are very close and therefore the bond will be nonpolar. If I look on the other side at a bond between a fluorine and an oxygen, once again, because the two atoms are close together, their bond will not be polar. We know this because we remember that the trend for electronegativity is up and towards the right on the periodic table. So now if I look at an example of a bond between something like oxygen to something like hydrogen, now I see a great difference in electronegativity, therefore the bond formed between them will be polar. A very common polar molecule is H2O, also known as water. Oxygen has a total of six valence electrons, and hydrogens each have one valence electron, 
So there will be a bond formed between every hydrogen and one lone oxygen electron. Being that oxygen is very highly electronegative, even though it's sharing its electrons with hydrogen, it still tends to keep the electrons towards itself, hogging the electron density. This gives oxygen a partial negative charge. Hydrogen, on the other hand, because its electron density is being stolen by the oxygen, has its nuclei slightly exposed. This gives each of the hydrogens a partial positive charge. Another word that arises in this concept is the dipole. And dipole comes from the word di and pole, meaning two poles or two opposites. This represents the partial negative end and partial positive end of the molecule, also known as the dipole moment. The dipole moment is represented by an arrow where the arrowhead points towards the partial negative and the tail end of the arrow points towards the partial positive. A good way to understand and remember which direction it's facing is to see the tail of the dipole moment as a positive charge. If I look at the water molecule, I notice that all the negativity is concentrated at the top and all the positivity is concentrated at the bottom. So I draw my dipole moment with the arrowhead at the top and the plus sign tail on the bottom. If you're still having trouble understanding the differences between the ionic, the polar, and the nonpolar covalent bonds, imagine a game of tug and war. These kids playing are both 12 years old, they're about equal size, equal strength, and they're both holding on to a rope. Now you can imagine that because they're equally matched, one kid will pull, the other kid will pull, but overall, no one is winning and no one is losing. And this is the concept of a regular or nonpolar covalent bond because the two players are equally matched. Imagine a second game of tug of war, but this time you have a 12 year old playing against a 10 year old. Now these kids are both average for their age, so even though the 10 year old can hold his own, the 12 year old will still be pulling most of the rope towards himself. And this is the concept of a polar bond because the 10 year old is not letting go, but the 12 year old is holding most of the rope towards himself. Our final competition takes place between a 12-year-old kid and a tiny little baby. There's no question that the 12-year-old will steal the rope from the baby, giving me the ionic bond. Our last topic of discussion will be the bond types or bond names. If we look at the example of fluorine from before, we see that one bond between the two fluorine atoms gives each fluorine a full octet. Same holds true for the hydrogen. These single bonds are called sigma bonds, represented by the Greek letter sigma. Notice that it takes two bonds to complete the oxygen octet, and it takes three bonds for the nitrogen to complete their octets. That initial bond that connects the two atoms together is still your sigma bond. But your second and your third bond, second on the oxygen and second and third on the nitrogen, are actually pi bonds. And this will come up a lot in organic chemistry, so just understand that even though you have a pi bond forming a double or triple bond between atoms, you still have that underlying sigma bonds connecting the two atoms together. In a later video, we will discuss bond types and shapes in more detail, so we'll leave it here for now. I hope you enjoyed this video, and be sure to see all five Intro to Orgo videos to ensure that when you start studying organic chemistry, you have a thorough understanding of the chemistry required to be able to ace the material. If you have any questions, I will be happy to help you with them. Simply post your questions in the comments below or send me an email and I will respond as soon as I can. Email your questions to tutorials at leahforsci.com. You can find additional study information and more tutorials on my website at www.lea, spelled L-E-A-H, the number four, S-C-I, dot com. And you can also find me right here on my YouTube channel, Lea for Sci Tutorials.